Hey, it's Alan, and I just wanted to let you know that you can now listen to the ongoing history of new music early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Our ears are amazing things. Evolution has created an ability that allows us to tell the direction of a sound, left and right, up and down, front and back. We can tell how close something might be, whether it's stationary or moving, and if it's coming towards us or going away. In other words, we hear sound in three dimensions. It's very helpful for humans on the plains of Africa who had to be worried about being eaten by a lion or something. This directionality also makes listening to music very enjoyable. The very same things that prevented us from being eaten allows us to appreciate music, whether it be live or recorded. With a live performance, we're in the same space as the musicians, so our ears and eyes work together when it comes to how we interpret what's going on in front of us. We're able to pick out all kinds of individual details, and that includes the bad stuff like unwanted echo and reverb, and we're always at the mercy of whoever is controlling and mixing the audio for a gig. But let's focus on recorded music. How do you create that illusion of sitting in front of a performer? And I'm talking about the ability to close your eyes and visualize where everyone is on stage. Okay, you got the singer out front, you got the guitar slightly to your right, the keyboardist is slightly to your left. You can tell that the drummer is further back than everyone else, but that parts of his kit are slightly spread out. And the bass player is in there somewhere, but it doesn't overwhelm the rest of the instruments. For the last 60 plus years, Technology has relied on a set of principles and techniques that allow recorded music to sound exponentially better than 99% of live performances, at least in terms of audio quality. Listening to music this way is a totally immersive experience. We call it stereo. And this is how this part of our musical lives came to be. It's the story of stereo, part one. This is the Ongoing History of New Music Podcast with Alan Cross. The Watchman with Stereo. Welcome again. I'm Alan Cross. And that's what we're going to be talking about on this program. The story of Stereo and how our current standard listening method to music came about. And along the way, it'll give me a chance to play some music related to this technology and to the experience of listening to music this way. Like I said at the beginning, our ears are really amazing. By being just a few centimeters apart, the width of our skulls, mated with the sound processing abilities of our brains, we're able to triangulate sound with incredible precision. This is because with two ears, a given sound will travel slightly different paths to each of them. This is called the time difference theory and binaural hearing. We're also able to zero in through everything we're hearing to just one specific sound. We're very good at being able to identify individual sounds of different intensities, even when they're all mixed together. Research also says our ears take turns when it comes to being the most sensitive. This sensitivity switch happens so fast no more than one-sixth of a second that we don't even notice it. And we can switch our concentration when it comes to different kinds of audio in just milliseconds. For example, it takes the brain about one-tenth of a second for it to pick up on the fact that somebody is talking to you. The sound of speech then gets the majority of the processing power in your brain. The word stereo comes from the Greek word for solid. Stereophonic sound means the use of two or more channels when it comes to reproducing sound. The audio comes from more than one source, and this is the way most of us enjoy music. The audio coming from the left channel is slightly different than what we hear from the right channel. This gives the music a spatial quality and enhances the overall experience of listening to music. But when it comes to recorded music, it wasn't always this way. In the beginning, which is to say starting with the introduction of Thomas Edison's talking machine, the phonograph, in 1877, all recorded music was in mono or monophonic. There's only one channel. There's no difference between the primary and secondary sounds entering our ears. As a result, our ears and our brains do not receive enough psychoacoustic information to create a natural sounding and realistic listening experience. With stereo, there's more clarity, an ability to feel and hear reverb, 
and we can sense if the music or the musicians are moving across the soundstage. Not so with mono. Now, let's get into a history of this thing that we call stereo. The first person to really study the idea of stereophonic sound was Clement Adder, an engineer working in Paris. He was working on a special sort of telephone transmission in 1881. The idea was to run telephone lines from an opera house or a theater to somebody's home. This was known as the theatrophone. Adder spaced 80 telephone transmitters, the microphones from telephones, across the front of the stage and then tied them all together into two channels, 40 for one and 40 for the other. People in their homes, using these direct lines, could be then connected and, using primitive earphones, hear a reasonably accurate sonic representation of what the audience was hearing. And again, this was 1881. It was essentially cable or wired radio, complete with a subscription fee. And it wasn't cheap, so this was mainly a plaything for the upper classes. But still, among those folks, it was wildly successful. The technology spread to Belgium, Germany, Hungary, and the UK. There were even experiments with this wired radio in the United States, involving broadcasts from Madison Square Garden. And the wired theatrophone did well for longer than you might think. It wasn't until 1932, a dozen years after radio started taking off, that the companies that were pushing this thing finally disappeared. And now, you know one of the reasons why people used to call the radio the wireless. You'd have to wait, but you could hear it on the AM radio. The theatrophone may have offered a version of stereo listening, but that was about the only version out there. Thomas Edison's cylinders and Emil Berliner's rotating discs could only capture and record the audio that came at the recording horns. These horns funneled sound down to a diaphragm. Connected to the diaphragm was a stylus that vibrated with the sound. Those vibrations were then transferred to a continuous groove cut into either a cylinder or a rotating disc. All the spatial attributes of the performance were lost, and the audio quality was terrible. Here's a sample of something recorded in 1895. Now, things did improve, especially after the 10-inch 78 RPM rotating disc became the standard format. This is how a typical recording from 1920 sounded. Okay, better, but still nowhere near what the music sounded like in person. So there was still plenty of work to be done. In 1925, an inventor named Capeller installed a new two-channel system at the Berlin Opera House using six microphones. Again, it worked like this. Stereophonic transmissions traveled down a wire to the homes of subscribers. I quote, Whoever has the opportunity to hear this stereophonic transmission is surprised by the effect. The sound seems much fuller and sharper in every detail. The different voices of chorus become notably more distinguishable from each other and from the orchestra. But, like I said earlier, wired radio was on its way out. However, Capeller was already broadcasting a stereo signal. That same year, this is 1925, an American station called WPAJ in New Haven, Connecticut, was experimenting with exactly the same thing. It used two transmitters one broadcasting at one frequency for the left channel and one for the right. You'd have to have two receivers at the other end, one tuned to the frequency for the left and then another for the right. Now, it did sound pretty good for the day, although you really needed to wear headphones to get the full effect. And headphones weren't exactly, well, good back then. Then a British company called Electrical and Musical Industries, or EMI, yes, the company that became the record label and the builder and owner of Abbey Road Studios, started looking at ways of recording two channels in a studio and then transferring those left and right channels to a record. This was known as the EMI Stereosonic Recording System. Bell, in the United States, was also working on this. On April 27, 1933, they conducted an experiment in binaural sound. What they did was accurately carve out a human head from some rubber. The head was called Oscar, by the way. And where the ears were, they put in microphones. 
The thinking was this head-shaped microphone arrangement would capture more sounds, like human ears. A performance by the Philadelphia Orchestra was broadcast this way down some telephone wires to Washington, D.C., and all agreed that it sounded pretty good, especially when they added additional amplifiers on the lines that boosted the frequency range of the transmission. They achieved a similar quality to today's FM radio, which, again, 1933, this was pretty cool. Uh, But then, well, you'll see. Let's take a bit of a break here and play some craft work. This is called Airwaves. There were some great strides in capturing music in stereo through the early 1930s. And then those engineers working on it just kind of lost interest. And for the next 25 years, not much was done. Most enthusiasm for the technology almost completely disappeared. And we will pick up the story there next. The development of stereo recording slowed down to a crawl in the 1930s and 40s. Mind you, there were other things to worry about, like uh, oh, the Depression, World War II, that kind of stuff. But companies in both the UK and the US kept tinkering with the idea. Some refused to give up on wired radio, saying that it was the only practical way to deliver music in two channels. And at the New York World's Fair in 1939, Bell demonstrated a way two channels could be cut into the groove of a record. But nothing much came of it. A Dutch engineer came up with something similar in 1940, and nothing happened. But then Walt Disney stepped in. In 1941, Disney released the movie Fantasia, the first motion picture with a stereo soundtrack. It was a bit primitive in its execution, but for the time, it was a marvel. Meanwhile, Nazi scientists developed their own stereo system for movies called the Stereophon. Again, very primitive compared to today, but it did work. It wasn't until after the war that engineers really got back to trying to make music playback sound more realistic on record. The first attempt was the Cook binaural clip conversion, which involved two styli in two cartridges and two tone arms. One needle fit into a groove for the left channel, and the other dropped into the groove for the right channel. Each channel was sent to its own amplifier, which in turn drove its own speaker. The result was left and right channel separation, creating a sound image that was bigger, louder, with more fidelity, better frequency response, and more realism. These were called duplex recordings, and a few of these records were produced and sold in stores. It did work, but you can see the obvious issues here. Pressing up a record with these double grooves was tricky. And of course, you had to make sure that each stylus was in the right groove. If you got it wrong, one channel would be slightly behind or slightly ahead of the other. And that didn't sound good. The bad news is that you didn't get much music on each side of a record because, well, you needed twice as many grooves. And that took up twice as much space. So, nice try, duplex recordings. But this wasn't going to bring stereo to the masses. Here's another song about records. This is Pearl Jam and Spin the Black Circle. The big breakthrough on the march toward stereophonic sound came with the adoption of magnetic recording tape. This was an invention of the Nazis. They had started experimenting with magnetic particles glued to a long, thin strip of plastic. After the war, these highly classified machines called magnetophones were discovered at an abandoned radio station near Frankfurt. A major in the U.S. Army had them disassembled and sent them back to America, where he established a company called Ampex that offered this new commercial recording system. One of his big investors was Bing Crosby. Bing wanted to be able to record his East Coast radio program and then go golfing instead of hanging around the studio for three hours to reprise the program for the West Coast. And he liked the idea of recording his shows in a recording studio instead of in front of a live audience, which could be a little unnerving. After some tinkering, these reel-to-reel tape machines were able to record in stereo. One half of the tape's width was given over to the left channel, while the other was for the right channel. These made it into the marketplace, and in May 1954, a company called Audiosphere released the first ever commercial stereo recordings. They were made at a music festival in Italy and featured some classical performances conducted by Vittorio Gui. (laughs) 
These reel-to-reel -reel tapes were 7.5 inches in diameter. A standard 1,200-foot reel usually ran at 7.5 inches per second, and that meant a single reel could hold two hours worth of music. For that time, that was insane. Two hours of uninterrupted music? Remember that people were still buying 78 RPM records that held four minutes of music per side max. These tapes and the machines that played them were expensive, but by 1957, prices had come down. At the same time, a new type of music fan was emerging. This was the audiophile, the kind of person who perpetually chased the most realistic sound possible for their homes. This meant speakers and amplifiers and tape machines and the best sounding source material available. They were after what the record labels were marketing under the term high fidelity. Ampex was the first company to unveil a home stereo system. It was the Model 612 and was soon succeeded by the better sounding Model 630. This was in the fall of 1955. These systems played records, but even though the long playing 33 and a third vinyl record had been introduced in 1948, all recordings were still in mono. For stereo, you had to make the move to tape. In 1957, 39 record companies were offering stereo reel-to-reel -reel tapes meant for home use. There were about 650 to choose from. And that year, RCA released a short film entitled How to Listen to New Dimensions in Sound. Listening to great music, such as Tchaikovsky's Romeo and Juliet, is always a thrilling experience. And through the remarkable achievements of modern electronic recording, a performance like this may be enjoyed in our homes whenever we please. It's true, of course, that listening to music at home is a matter of personal preference and taste. Now, here's a man named Smith. He's the relax and drink in the beauty of it all type of listener. What have we here? Another Smith? He's of the, look ma, I'm a conductor too school of listening. Hmm, looks like fun. And a third Smith? Yes, this Smith is one of those, did you hear that English horn over the viola tremolos type of listeners. Now, all these Smiths simply go to prove two things. One, different Smiths enjoy listening to music differently. Two, almost every home music lover is in search of the same thing. The truest, most lifelike reproduction of the original music possible. Or, perfect fidelity. fidelity or hi-fi but what is hi-fi and what's the difference between a high fidelity record player and any good ordinary record player so let's ask Smith he should know <coughs> excuse me uh, could you tell us... Oh, yes, pardon me, you're listening, aren't you? Well, all right. It just so happens I know a Smith or two who also know a hi-fi when they hear it. Time for a song about reel-to-reel -reel tapes. This is Hugh Dillon from the Headstones, who really seems to like these machines. I'd rather be down in my basement with the reel -to -reel The big problem with stereo tapes was that they were very expensive, and so were the reel-to-reel -reel machines needed to play them. You could get a bit of a discount on new tapes by subscribing to a tape club, but they were still out of range for most people. The other issue was that the tape technology was moving so fast that this expensive gear was becoming outdated within just a few months. There were a couple of different types of machines requiring their own format of tapes, so this is just like the old VHS versus beta fight. The best solution was to find a way of turning LPs from mono to stereo. EMI came out with another version of the two-styli disc 
that played at 16 and two-thirds RPM. Didn't work. Bing Crosby Enterprises had a system called VL, which stood for vertical and lateral. That described how a single groove tracked the left and right channels. Not very good either. Other companies offered solutions. There was MSD, which was short for Minter Stereo Disc, after its inventor. CBS Records came up with their Columbia system. But the real breakthrough came with a company called Westrex in 1957. They built a cutter that carved a 45-degree groove, a little valley, in the vinyl. One side of this valley contained the left channel, and the other contained the right. And this worked. After a demonstration of the Westrex system at an engineering convention, just about all the labels jumped on board, and this became the industry standard. The floodgates opened. Stereo LPs had finally arrived. High fidelity now meant stereo. An English label called Pi may have been the first to release stereo discs in May 1958. The following month, RCA showed off 55 records, along with 15 new phonographs and seven different types of high-end speakers. Later that month, May 1958, Admiral, Zenith, and Ampex followed suit with even more gear. And by the time of the National Association of Music Merchants gathered in Chicago in July 1958, it was obvious that stereo was here and it was the way forward. Of the 235 exhibitors, about a quarter of them had some kind of stereo equipment on display. By October, 60 manufacturers were offering some kind of stereo gear. The next development came with the Stereo 7-inch single. They first appeared in May 1959. Stereo took off so fast that the 78 RPM single was dead by 1963. And within 10 years, not a single major record label was bothering to sell records made in mono. And as prices for equipment came down, everybody started building their own stereo systems. Stereo system. More on the story of stereo coming up, including the era when it really got abused. A little more detail on the story of stereo before we wrap up part one. Recording in stereo and releasing stereo records became a big deal in the 1960s. There was a period of transition when things moved away from mono recordings. The Beatles, for example, recorded in mono all the way through to the White Album. But because stereo records were seen as better, those mono master recordings were rechanneled into fake stereo. The biggest brand name for this process was Duophonic. You might see some old records labeled with that name, or you may see an older album marked electronically rechanneled for stereo. This fake stereo was created by splitting the mono signal into two and then putting a bit of delay or reverb on both. That worked okay, but it didn't give you anything like a proper stereo effect, something that you would record in stereo in the studio. And if you've ever done A-B comparisons between those rechanneled Beatles recordings and the original mono masters, you probably believe that the mono recordings sound better because that's how they were recorded and that's how they were engineered. It also took a while for producers and engineers to stop treating stereo as a novelty. They took the channel separation to an extreme. We would never do something like this now. Here's an example. In 1967, the Velvet Underground released the White Light, White Heat album. There's a track on this record called The Gift. I'm going to play it for you. Listen to how everything is panned over to the extreme left and the extreme right. There is nothing in the middle. The thinking was that listeners would use their balance controls to find the most pleasing stereo mix. It just ended up being distracting. Waldo Jeffers had reached his limit. It was now mid-August, which meant he had been separated from Marsha for more than two months. In two months, all he had to show were three dog-eared letters and two very expensive long-distance phone calls. See what I mean? Stereo changed everything the way about music was recorded, heard, and broadcast. On part two of the story of stereo, we'll get into how this technology changed the radio industry, how it sold billions of dollars worth of gear, and how it led to the multi-multi-multi-multi-channel world that we live in today. You may never hear things quite the same way again, which is exactly the point. All these programs are available as podcasts. Just go to Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or whatever your platform of choice may be. Download and go. 
There are hundreds to choose from, and make sure you subscribe so you never miss an episode. And please leave a review and rating if you get a chance. And oh yeah, they're all in stereo. There's my website, which is ajournalofmusicalthings.com. It's updated every day with new and interesting music news and music recommendations. We can connect on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And don't forget about email for getting in touch. The address is alan at alancross.ca. The story of stereo part two next time. Technical production in a stereo studio is by Rob Johnston. I'm Alan Cross. You've been listening to the Ongoing History of New Music podcast with Alan Cross. Subscribe to the podcast through iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, and everywhere you find your favorite podcasts. 